Well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Frederick Wensnes, and I want to welcome everyone to yet another NetHope Solution Center webinar. And uh, today we are very pleased to um, be joined by Mercy Corps Cisco and National Rescue Committee uh, to talk about SignPost, um, a tool that uh, really revolutionizing the uh, way to, to uh, communicate with and amongst um, uh, refugee populations and other crisis-affected uh, individuals. So uh, we're in for a, quite a treat today. Uh, before we get started, I want to just go over the overall housekeeping rules. So I'll uh, suggest everybody start or open up the chat window. Uh, you do that by uh, clicking the little blue balloon on the bottom of your screen and um, you can uh, there uh, post your questions for the Q&A session later on and also watch the communication that's going on between the attendees. And uh, at the end of the hour, we will facilitate a question and answer session. Um, so please uh, keep um, putting your questions in there and we'll, we'll uh, get to them uh, towards the end of the hour. Uh, we're also recording the session today um, and you'll receive an email with the link to the recording and the collateral uh, that will be posted on the NetUp Solutions Center uh, later today. Please feel free to share that with your colleagues and others that may be interested in the, in the topic. Uh, you will also see an online survey at the very end of the session or after the end of the session today. We'd certainly appreciate you answering a few questions there and you'll also get a chance to indicate if you want to be contacted by the speakers or by NetHope as a result of this webinar. So with uh, no further ado, I want to introduce Leila Toplik. Leila Toplik is with Net, uh, NetHope and uh, she's heading up our No Lost Generation tech, uh, tech Task Force. And I'll pass it on to you, Leila. Thank you, Frederick. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Um, welcome to our fall edition of the NLG Tech Task Force webinars. Um, for those of you who are new to the NLG Tech Task Force, just uh, um, first of all, a welcome to uh, the task force. And then briefly, uh, this task force was set up by NetHope and the No Loss Generation Initiative with the support from Microsoft and TripAdvisor to facilitate um, collaborations within the humanitarian sector and between the humanitarian sector and the, uh, and the private sector with a focus on tech-enabled programs for conflict-affected children and youth, and specifically meeting the needs like education, employment, participation, and protection. And while we focus on the needs of millions of children and youth affected by the Syrian and Iraqi crisis, all of the resources and projects are available globally. And in fact, task force is open to all global and local NGOs, private sector companies, academic institutions, entrepreneurs, and host governments. And since we launched it in March of 2017, we've had over 70 organizations uh, join us. You're seeing some of them on this slide. So in terms of resources and, and also future webinars, there are some great resources that I want to make sure for those of you who are new to the task force that you're aware of. There is valuable information about program design, technology tools, educational content, and also contacts, partners that you could be working with. And all of this is documented either in the past webinar, so 17 to be precise, or in our blog post. Um, another, um, another resource for you is how specifically to engage um, private sector in working with you to support the needs of conflict affected children and youth. And we have uh, published um, um, private sector guide that provides a framework and also some excellent examples. Again, um, available to you and to your partners. And in terms of um, the webinars, we have um, two coming up in October. So we'll do two instead of one in October. Um, we'll have World Reader uh, with their partner in Jordan. And we'll also have Southern New Hampshire University with their partner in Africa. And stay tuned. Um, and you'll be receiving, as long as you're signed up for the task force, you will receive the invitations to these webinars. So now on to the feature presentation for today, um, this specific program is truly an example of cross-sector tech-enabled collaboration 
that is focused on addressing specific needs, and in this case, need for timely and relevant information for conflict-affected populations, including children and youth. And SignPost provides information to people where they are, including up-to-date information on legal rights, accommodation, transportation, as well as educational resources. And here we have three fantastic representatives of this cross-sector collaboration to share with you more and also to invite you to be part of this work. Um, and now it's my pleasure to introduce to you Megan reiner Geil from Mercy Corps, Aaron Connor from Cisco, and Alex Horowitz from the International Rescue Committee. Over to you, Megan. Great, thanks, Leila. Um, and thanks everyone for joining. I'm really excited to be able to speak about Signpost with Aaron and Alex. Uh, this has been one of the most creative and iterative and collaborative projects that I've ever worked on. Uh, so we're really excited to share it and to invite you guys to be partners in the future. All right, so what is the problem that Signpost is trying to solve? Um, Signpost very generally is trying to make sure that the limitations to access to information are taken away as much as possible for crisis-affected populations. Uh, this started as a partnership between Mercy Corps and the International Rescue Committee in 2015 in response to the um, Greece-Syria uh, refugee crisis. So when people were landing on the islands and on the mainland, they often didn't even know where they were. Um, we created a mobile app that was very light and simple and provided top line information about like where hospitals were, what services were offered in camps, how to register uh, with UNHCR, et cetera. Um, and it also geolocated so people could know where they were. Um, after that program ran for a bit, we, we realized that we were getting, there were a lot of lessons learned from it. It was one of the first sort of digital information dissemination campaigns that either organization had ever done. And um, we were getting more and more information about what our users actually needed and how we needed to change the program. And so both of the organizations decided to continue the partnership and to expand it globally. And so that's where we're, what we're really doing now is focusing on expansion in terms of geography, uh, the types of tools that we use, and the, type, and the groups of people that we're trying to reach. So we'll get into that more in a bit. So as I mentioned before, um, the Signpost program connects vulnerable populations in the areas we work with the vital information they need to solve their most pressing problems. Um, this could be some of the obvious things, like where services are, how do I get my child into school, um, how do I register, how do I become uh, legal where I'm living, what documentation do I need in order to get the services that I, that I can get um, in the country that I'm living in. Um, but it can also be simple things, like if I'm trying to integrate into a new society, how do I make sure that I don't get a ticket on the bus? <laughs> how, do I get, um, how do I get out of a ticket that I've received? Um, what, is, what are the legal services available to me? Um, so it's, it can be very detailed information, very context-specific information, and also very general information. And so we have really designed a model that we'll be getting into a bit with Alex that ideally is very responsive to what our, our users need. So we can monitor the questions that they're asking, um, and then we can make sure that the content that we're providing is as responsive as possible. Um, this is a partnership between Mercy Corps and the International Rescue Committee at the moment. We are very interested in looking at other people, other organizations who are interested in partnering with us on a global level as well as on the local level. Um, we've also been supported by amazing private partners. Uh, Cisco, Google, Microsoft, and TripAdvisor have all been incredibly involved from the beginning of the program and are longtime supporters, both um, with funding and with in-kind and still support. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we started in Refugee Info with, uh, in Greece, and we're now expanded into six European countries, um, and we're also working in Jordan and El Salvador. So Signpost is a very interesting project in the way that it's organized at the global level. Uh, Mercy Corps and the IRC are on a global sort of leadership council. We make all strategic decisions together. Um, we manage the programs together. And then on the ground, each organization leads a particular instance. So for example, in Europe, where we're refugee.info, uh, IRC is the lead in that, uh, in that instance. So they decide the strategy, they decide what types of schools are going to be used based on assessments and um, focus group discussions with our users. Um, and so they really drive the content in that area. 
In Jordan, um, which is another instance, Mercy Corps is the lead. And so we take the lead in terms of deciding strategy um, and again, what types of content we're gonna be covering. We also have very collaborative uh, partnerships, as I mentioned earlier, with our private partners. Um, so Cisco, for example, is providing equipment and hardware for connectivity, Meraki systems, in refugee camps and in community centers. And so we as Mercy Corps have taken the lead on that and we're providing connectivity in 45 sites across Europe uh, so that our users can actually access the tools that we're providing online. Um, and I will hand over to Erin briefly to, to sort of introduce her partnership and why they were so interested in the program. Sure, thanks Megan. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I am speaking, I guess, um, as one of several uh, private sector partners, but I can speak uh, at least from the Cisco perspective in terms of why we got involved and why we're really excited about um, Refugee Info, now Signpost. We first began supporting Refugee Info in the fall of 2015. So shortly after uh, it was developed, we supported it with a disaster grant which for Cisco we provide uh, following disasters um, to strategic nonprofit partners that are to support the relief activities, typically when there is a technology focus. Um, so at that time we were supporting, for example, the um, crisis informatics work that NetHope was doing, and then we also supported um, the launch of Refugee Info that IRC and Mercy Corps were implementing. At, at the time, our tactical operations team, our TAC ops team, uh, was starting to deploy alongside NetHope to set up Wi-Fi hotspots along the migration route. Um, and our TAC ops team is, um, they serve a CSR function, they're in our security and trust organization, and their purpose essentially is to set up emergency connectivity for partners and communities um, when systems are down, so oftentimes after disasters, and um, they've been doing this for about 13 years, started after Hurricane Katrina, and for a long time, they would set up connectivity for first responders and emergency agencies to be able to, to coordinate the relief activities. Um, and I think it was with Greece, with NetHope, I think it was the first time that they started actually setting up connectivity for affected populations, really recognizing the importance of connectivity um, for people that were displaced, um, the importance of being able to connect with loved ones and access information. And that's also why supporting Refugee Info for us made so much sense, because it was building off of our connectivity efforts, um, but not just connecting them to the internet, but really directing people to accurate, curated, up-to-date information that was specific to their situation, to their location, uh, and often available in their local language. And so we actually, to begin with, started coordinating where we would, um, in all of the, the sites where we were setting up connectivity with NetHope, we would direct traffic to Refugee Info as the landing page. So you get connected, automatically goes to Refugee Info based on where you are, your local geography. Um, so that, for us, just made a lot of sense as it was, there was a clear tie-in um, with our product and need on the ground. And what also appealed to us really was that this was a joint initiative between IRC and Mercy Corps. Um, it wasn't different organizations coming up with their own solutions, but there really was true collaboration and coordination on the ground to develop this. Great, thanks Erin so much. Um, and just to discuss the, the general partnership a little bit more, how the model works. Uh, so as I mentioned before, Mercy Corps and the International Rescue Committee are global partners. So we have owned the program, we've designed it, and we also determine expansion plans. But at the local level for our instances, we partner with, with multiple organizations. So we partner with organizations on the ground to share information about their services that they're going to be providing or any news or updates that they need to share so they can help contribute to content. Um, and then we also partner in the Wi-Fi by creating um, MOUs or memorandums of understanding and agreements with organizations that are running refugee camps, they're running community centers to install the Wi-Fi equipment, manage it remotely, and then assist them in maintaining and managing those systems. So at all levels, we're very interested in working with people kind of where they're at. So helping them to share information, helping to work with them if they hear information that needs to be shared um, or questions that they're getting. Um, and then also creating collaboration and coordination between partners on the ground. So 
So Signpost is really, it's a protection program at its heart, and we, we really work to empower individuals. Um, we believe that if we provide interactive, accessible, accurate, relevant, responsive, and timely information to people made vulnerable by crises, and natural disasters. They will be empowered to address their needs and make informed decisions. So we really emphasize providing objective, verified, truthful information that people can trust on those platforms that they're already using and in a language that they can understand easily. Um, so a lot of times uh, information may be available, but it might be old, it might be a rumor, um, it might be in a language that it, it might be in the host country's language as opposed to the, the crisis affected population's language. Um, it, it could be unavailable to certain vulnerable populations. So there's a whole host of reasons why information may not be made available. And people are often forced to make decisions, life-changing decisions. Um, for them and their families without the appropriate information and without sort of a guiding hand. Um, and so we, we really aim to be there as a supporting force to help people make their own choices about their own lives in an educated way. Who is our target audience? Um, it's interesting because I was, I was talking to Layla earlier about this and uh, really our target audience is anybody in the geographies that we're working who needs information. Um, obviously, we, we aim to reach sort of the top populations. Um, so in Greece, for example, we work a lot with Syrian refugees, um, with people from Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, Iran. Um, so we know the general populations that we're, that we're aiming to serve, but we can, we do try to help anyone that reaches out to us for information needs. Um, of course, because of the platforms that we're using right now, digital platforms primarily, um, which I'll get into in a bit, uh, a large population that we're serving is youth. And so quite a bit of the work that we do is around providing information about continuing education, language classes, um, entrepreneurship classes, or you know, basically skills to help youth really re integrate into the societies that they're moving into and stay as safe as possible while doing so. Um, so in Europe and Jordan, we serve primarily refugee and asylum-seeking populations, as I mentioned. Um, in Europe, we provide, we, that's our longest instance, so we've been there now since 2015, um, and the type of information is incredibly varied, especially because we're now working in, um, in several countries there. Uh, in Jordan, we're much more targeted, so we started there last year, um, and we provide primarily information about civil documentation requirements in order to receive services as a Syrian refugee from the Jordanian government. In El Salvador, which is our newest instance, um, we are working to help victims of gang violence receive information about services, so in a private and secure way. So there, it's an incredibly um, dangerous context, especially when it comes to privacy and security. And so this has been a new model for us. We just started off I think this month, actually. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so we're really interested to see how that evolves particularly as it's really integrated into a protection program there. All right, so I kind of already got into this a bit, um, but yeah, we're currently in seven countries. Uh, so we're in Greece, Serbia, Bulgaria, Hungary, and Italy in Europe, and then we're in Jordan in the Middle East, and we're also in El Salvador in Latin America. Um, we are definitely looking to expand globally. We've prioritized a couple of areas, one of those being North Africa, so that we can really catch, or North and West Africa, so that we can ideally catch people along their migration routes, make sure that they're as informed as possible, and then they know they have an information source. You know, they can either choose, they'll make their own choices about the movements, um, but they at least have sort of along the whole route that provides verified and truthful information to the degree possible. Um, in the Middle East, uh, this is a priority as well. Um, we're definitely exploring the possibility of expanding into Iraq, um, it, as it's another area where the population is actively using digital tools and also information is a high priority. Um, we're keeping an eye on Latin America as well, particularly in relation to the Venezuela migrant, migrant crisis, uh, so we're talking to partners there. All right, so one of the things that I think is most unique about the Signpost program is that we apply elements of human-centered design principles to our design. So the program is designed by our users, for our users from the very start. Um, so we really start, we start with focus group discussions, um, and Alex will get into this in a bit. We've worked with Google uh, significantly for both of our two older instances, so refugee.info in Europe and habrona.info in Jordan. Um, and so we'll definitely discuss that, but 
really what we've worked to have is a suite of assessment tools that allows us to understand the information landscape in a geography when we land on the ground. So what are the information gaps? For whom are those gaps the worst? Um, what are the information sources that people are currently using? What are the information sources they trust or don't trust and why and why not? Um, what types of tools are they using? So they did, do they have access to phones? And if they have access to phones, are those smartphones or basic phones? Um, is data incredibly expensive? Do they have access to connectivity? So we really try to get the broad idea and picture for every target population that we're aiming to serve um, so that we can understand what package needs to be put together in order to provide as comprehensive of an information landscape as we can. Um, we also never stop iterating. So because we're using tools like Facebook and private messaging, we're able to monitor and keep track of the types of questions and comments that people are making. And so we're really able to feed our content almost on a like daily cyclical basis. So we, we know what the questions are and we're able to respond as quickly as we can get verified and truthful information out there. So our users feel that we're very responsive to them and that we're listening to them. And so they see the results of what they're asking for um, almost immediately. Uh, so it's a place where they feel heard. Um, we also like to go where our target audience is. So at the moment, we're primarily using Facebook, a website, a mobile app, and a blog, as well as connectivity. Um, but that could change in a different, a different geography. So for example, in North Africa, um, North or West Africa, we may transition to more of an SMS or an IVR model if those are the tools that people are using to communicate with each other and they're already comfortable with them. So we really want to eliminate the barrier of people having to learn how to use a new tool, having to go somewhere. Um, we want to make sure that the information is provided to people where they are. Um, in terms of solutions, yeah, I kind of covered that, but very, and Alex will go in more into detail, but one of the reasons that we provide such a broad variety of tools to receive information on is that people need different types of information at different times and in different ways. So we started with a mobile app, as I mentioned, and it originally had very lightweight or light touch information. So information that people on the move would require. However, when the, when the EU Turkey deal happened in March, 2016, um, we realized we needed much more context-specific information because people were stuck. They didn't, they didn't need that kind of quickly moving information anymore. Um, and they were actually offloading the app because it was taking up space and it didn't provide the information they needed. And so we did quite a large reorganization of the program. We scaled up the team and we expanded to Facebook. We also changed our website so that it was providing much more detailed service mapping information with a filterable map. Um, and then we also added a blog as well, which could provide in-depth information. So for example, um, if there was a difficult legal process, then we could provide a full article for those people who needed it. Um, the Facebook page, both surprisingly and unsurprisingly, I think was the, is and was the most popular tool once we released it. So we saw almost a 20% increase in users for the first four months after, after releasing the Facebook page, and it's still our most popular element wherever we've rolled out. Um, and I think that's mostly because we have hired a team of moderators from the populations that we're serving to communicate with our users. So they're able to answer the posts and comments on the page, they're able to answer private Facebook messages, and they do so, you know, as a friend or as a community member. So it feels like a friendly space. Um, another huge, uh, huge piece of, I think, why this program has been able to spread so quickly is that we are working on the connectivity side of things. So. You know, it's it's all well and good to provide a mobile app or an information, a digital information dissemination tool, but if people can't access it or if they're having to choose between a Skype call to UNHCR or a Skype call with their family and accessing information on a Facebook page because they have limited data, I think we all know what they're going to choose. Um, and so we've really tried as much as possible, especially in Europe where we've been there the longest, to create relationships with people, with refugee, the organizations running refugee camps so that we can provide hotspots in a safe way. Um, as I mentioned before, we're a protection program. So when we provide a hotspot, we really make sure that it's accessible to all populations. So there's a safe space for women to access Wi-Fi or unaccompanied minors to the degree they need. So, um, we make sure that we're looking at that the, the system itself is safe so that people aren't going to accidentally download a virus. Um, we also make sure that the hours that the Wi-Fi is offered are at safe times so that you don't have people congregating in an area at midnight. 
Um, so we've really tried to create a series of best practices and tools around how to do that in a safe way. Um, we also work with a uh, partnership model. So we provide hardware expertise and manage remote management of the system to an organization on the ground. They can, as long as they can provide a safe space for that Wi-Fi to be provided, and um, and they can cover the ISP costs. And then we work with them on a sustainability plan for long term. Um, so yeah, very generally, I'm going to get into the to sort of how we design our content, um, and then I'm going to hand over to Alex on the next slide to really talk about the refugee.info instance, which, as I mentioned, is our longest running instance, and so has, I think, a lot of really interesting <laughs> interesting pieces to it um, that we're now applying to our other instances. Um, so. As I mentioned, Signpost provides information to people where they are in some simple, digestible language and in a responsive way. And so we've kind of pulled from a journalistic model in that sense. So we have an editing team or a team of editors who are on the ground. They're usual, usually from the country that we're working in, and they create relationships with the organizations, with the coordination groups, with the government, so that they can go and get the information that we need. Um, we then work to really make it as understandable as possible. So uh, we make sure that we change, we adjust the language that is easily understood. We make sure that we try to dispel any rumors that have come up around any of the information that we've received. And we also try to be as truthful as possible. So if we don't have a question, an answer to a question, we're very clear about that. And we also say what we're doing in order to see if we can get an answer. So, and that's one of the responses we get from people very often is that, you know, even though we may not have an answer, we do respond and we let people know so that they're not left hanging wondering. Um, so just looking at the graphic here uh, in terms of our kind of information gathering and our process. So step one is to create comprehensive and accessible information sharing platforms. So we want to know where people are, what they're using, and then we want to adopt those platforms so that they don't have to do work to get the information. Um, again, we really work to provide safe and accessible Wi-Fi so that as long as people have the tool, they can access the information. Um, we then provide two-way communication via our community building, social media, and analog channels. So we want to be in touch with our users. You know, we don't want to be guessing what information they need because, okay, we might get the top line stuff, but most of the time the information that people really need is um, very detailed and not something we would know unless we asked. So we're in constant communication with our users about the type of content that we have on our page. Um, we then also like to ensure that there's access to digital support communities and service providers. So we all we work with a whole host of service providers in the areas that we work. We create relationships with them, and then we can share that information with our users. Um, in most of our instances, we do not do case management, so we will not take on a case and then walk them through the whole process. Again, we're about empowerment and choice. So we'll provide information about how to reach those service providers. And then most, in most cases, um, we will, those, the user will then take that information and act on it. Um, and then step five, cycling back into step one, as I mentioned earlier, we really, really focus on user feedback and incorporating that into platforms. And that can be about the type of content we provide. It can be about how we share the content. So is it a video, is it text? Um, and then it can also include the types of platforms we're using. And with that, I'm gonna hand over to Alex. Thanks, Megan. Um, I'm going to go um, a little bit more into detail um, about, you know, kind of how we got to this point um, with Refugee Info um, uh, from the point where we were at um, and to the point where we are now um, primarily focused um, on Facebook. Um, as Megan touched on, um, the EU-Turkey deal um, changed everything for our users and um, changed everything for us, too. Um, uh, when that happened, you know, as touched on as well, we, you know, we um, we asked them how we could better serve, serve them and our users. Uh, right, there's so much of echo. I hope you can hear me. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we changed how we provided information um, by uh, by trying to focus um, all of our efforts on creating sort of a two-way communication model. Um, so, um, as you know, our users told us where we'd really like to get information um, at this point is Facebook. We're already using Facebook. And in fact, um, refugees were already congregating in Facebook groups of their own. Um, 
as were um, smugglers. Um, there's a lot of smuggling activity um, on social media as well. Um, and uh, as you can see um, in the graphic on the left, um, this is a, a question that a user asked us. Um, they um, shared a rumor that they'd heard on Facebook um, about um, what happens when you uh, um, when you're coming from Turkey to Greece, um, uh, and it was information they'd received from a smuggler. Um, and so this team of journalists that we hired um, uh, spoke with all the relevant authorities, and they also spoke with um, uh, refugees who had uh, recently messaged us about the same issue, um, figured out what the um, heart of the of the truth was, and then um, we created this sort of Facebook-friendly graphic. Um, and it was accompanied by um, more information. Um, and that's a really responsive model that's very different from um, where we started, which was just um, sort of one-way communication. Um, and I think that the shift to Facebook um, uh, brought about what I really think is the most exciting part of this project now, um, which is this team of, of refugee community managers that we have. Um, we call our Facebook moderators, um, and they're um, uh, they work with us through um, an organization called Natakalam. Um, uh, and these uh, these moderators, as Megan mentioned, um, they're all refugees and asylum seekers um, um, in Europe and the Middle East. Um, and they're talking every day, directly answering questions, um, directly answering comments um, that people leave on our Facebook posts. Um, and so it's really that sort of um, that peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, your own language, um, any time of day uh, uh, communication that we think makes we think makes this project particularly special. Um, when we when these moderators join our team, um, they get training in social media management, um, protection principles. Um, they learn how to manage our digital tools, um, and they also learn how to communicate in a way that empowers users to make their own choices. Um, so, um, kind of a, a a change from um, traditional humanitarian information that may um, uh, tell people what to do. Um, our moderators uh, provide options. Um, if you do this, then then this is the result you can likely expect. Um, uh, the other really cool thing um, about the, mo the moderation program is that um, our moderators um, build skills and they gain experience that they can use um, later to parlay into careers you know, in social media, um, digital communication, customer service, you know, project management, um, social services, and you know, of course the humanitarian sector. Um, so um, uh, oh, you can see here also, um, this is kind of a typical interaction um, on this slide um, between, uh, between our moderators and our team. So here's a user asked us, um, uh, they'd heard a rumor that they needed to go to the, F the, um, the embassy of Afghanistan to apply for a passport. Um, so our moderator checks with, the, with um, Lambrini, she's a journalist in Greece um, on our team, and um, she researched the answer, um, supplied it to Gaya, um, a Syrian moderator um, based in Lebanon, who um, then uh, responded to the user um, with, with the information in a friendly way. Something else that's kind of interesting about um, this approach is that um, we've um, we've learned more and more. We're learning more and more about how the traumatized brain processes information. Um, and uh, for many people um, among our users, you know, many of our users have experienced significant trauma. Um, and uh, being able to get information through our moderation team um, means that they can have a friendly voice walking them through what could be a really complicated procedure um, or, or process, um, which in Europe often many of the um, bureaucratic processes that, um, that refugees uh, need to navigate um, can be quite complex and often um, require knowledge of the local language. Um, I think, uh, next slide, Megan, please. <laughs> So um, this shift to Facebook has led us to some really cool innovations um, in how we prepare in, and how we provide information um, and uh, helped us um, uh, create this, you know, really innovative and unprecedented form of two-way communication over social media. But the other thing that this move to focus on Facebook, um, the opportunity it provides us is to really boost the reach of our messages um, and messages of other organizations and messages um, of refugees as well. 
Um, so you've probably heard um, uh, about the um, the ways that companies can use um, Facebook to target to create targeted ads, um, which has been under a lot of scrutiny lately. Um, and we try to use um, kind of some of the same principles for good. So um, we identify refugees in Europe um, through their um, language preferences and the interests that they've indicated on Facebook, and we push that information um, into their news feeds. Um, that doesn't that doesn't mean that um, we can push anything in there. Um, out, uh, Facebook has a complicated algorithm that requires us to create really strong content that competes in the sort of marketplace of content um, in order for it to get the widest possible reach. And so for that reason, we have um, graphic design capacity. Um, we have a multimedia team. Um, like for example, the the photo on this slide was <laughs> taken by our um, team photographer. Um, and that's really important to making sure that you get the best return on investment um, for pushing out information in the social media space. Um, next slide, please. Thanks. Um, so uh, I thought maybe we could just provide like a couple um, mini case studies of you know how this kind of two-way communication um, feedback loop works um, and. Um, one of the ways that um, this project has had um, had the chance to test out um, some of its uh, innovations in two-way communication is um, through the um, the cash assistance program in Greece. Um, and in 2017, um, we worked with uh, UNHCR to produce information about the cash program in Greece. Um, it can be really difficult to uh, register for cash um, as a refugee or asylum seeker. Um, uh, and so the second that we put out this information, um, it, it, you know, we'd let refugees in Greece know that we, we were um, open to talking about cash and our inbox just blew up. Um, users had tons of questions. Um, they couldn't figure out how to register. Um, they didn't uh, know exactly if they were eligible. They, um, and and it, in large numbers, they were, we were getting messages from refugees who were in um, parts of Athens and um, other parts of Greece where they, they had maybe made that transition out of a camp. Um, they were living in an apartment that they were renting on their own or that somebody else um, was renting for them, and they didn't have that sort of direct face-to-face -face interaction with um, a caseworker or service provider um, that they might have had before. Um, and uh, through that, um, through the, this flood of messages, we took that to um, the cash agencies in Greece and said, you know, we're getting this massive influx of messages from people who um, don't have the infrastructure to get registered for cash assistance. And um, so we worked together and ultimately ended up creating a um, Facebook referral mechanism uh, for, um, for refugees um, in Athens. And we ended up helping um, more than a thousand of some of the hardest to reach people um, get cash assistance. Um, and this is a, a really good um, uh, kind of experiment to see, you know, how, how can we use social media to reach people that aren't getting reached by, or aren't reached by traditional service service um, outreach, and how can we um, how can we boost the reach of of, uh, of other organizations' programs? Um, uh, just quickly, um, another couple of examples um, is that here's one. Each year we work with the Greek Ministry of Education and UNICEF and the um, the Education Working Group in Greece to put out information on school enrollment. And that's so that um, refugees can enroll themselves and um, get their own children enrolled and follow this sort of complicated procedure. But also um, other NGOs use our blog post with the requirements each year, give it to their field staff, um, and uh, um, use that to create more and more opportunities for school enrollment for refugee kids in Greece. Um, another thing that we've done is um, taken messages that we receive from refugees about things that aren't working, um, leveraged our position to uh, to bring um, to bring those messages to the to the authorities that have the power to change the situation, and then seen actual change. Um, we uh, shared information um, about uh, the um, about uh, refugees having difficulty accessing um, social security numbers and um, with the relevant authority, and they made a change, um, and then. Uh, refugees message us to say they couldn't get tickets on the Athens metro, um, 
uh, because there's a glitch in the system and we worked with the transit authority to make that happen. Um, so uh, those are just some of the cool things that we can do um, when we're able to reach more people and then um, amplify their voices through our platform. Um, and so with that, I'll turn it back to you, Megan. Great, thanks, Alex. All right, so I'm gonna take a quick moment and hopefully share my screen <laughs> and give you a quick demo of of the Facebook page in Italy. So um, this is our, we've rolled out our Facebook page in Italy. Um, sorry, ah, <laughs> the dangers of Facebook. <laughs> um, we rolled out our Facebook page in Italy this spring. Uh, we have a different, a slightly different model in Italy than we do in Greece. So in Greece, we had all of the language that, languages that we were offering on a similar page because the needs of most of those groups were quite similar. Um, however, in Italy, the groups are very diverse, the language types are very diverse, and so we decided to make language-specific uh, Facebook pages. So I'm going to go ahead and show you the English page because you'll actually be able to understand what's on it. Uh, so one of the first things that we found out in Italy when we went and did an assessment was that many unaccompanied minors uh, who are supposed to be working through centers, through community centers provided by the government in Italy, uh, were, were leaving the centers for a couple of days or more. Um, this may not seem like a problem. However, in many cases, if the youth leave a center without notifying the center, um, they would lose their spot in that center and thus also lose their spot in the registration process. And so then you have unaccompanied minors with really no access to government services who are lost in the system. And so one of the first information campaigns we did was to push out a video to really inform the youth that they, you know, they at least need to inform the center when they're going to be gone for, for more than a certain period of time. Uh, so I know we're, I'm conscious we are getting close on time, but we'll just watch this video real quickly and then move on. All right, so that's that's just an example of some of the media that we try to show. Um, there should have been music. It sounds like the music wasn't working. So do feel free to go and explore and follow those pages. Um, and yeah, we, we would love to have people keeping track of what's going on on our Facebook pages. Um, as I mentioned earlier, one of the things we really try to do is offer information in a variety of different platforms, or not platforms, but content types so that you know, again, if literacy is an issue or if there are certain, uh, if there are disabilities uh, such as hearing or, or visual, we can provide types of information that people can still access. And so that's one of the things we're working on this year is diversifying how we provide content so that we are, again, trying to reach as many vulnerable groups as possible. All right. Um, so what are some of our current outcomes? Uh, so since 2015, we have reached over 970,000 unique users. 
Um, we are getting really close to that million mark, so we're really excited and we're monitoring that closely. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're active in seven countries. We've also maintained a 5% growth rate for the last year, so um, we're looking to keep that. Um, it, keeps, it keeps steadily increasing, um, and that's pretty consistent across most of our instances. Um, just to give an idea of the, the massive amount of messages we receive, uh, this year we've received over 12,000 private messages from users. And um, those are whole conversations. So there have been 12,000 pr private conversations, not just individual back and forth messages. Um, we're also currently working in seven different, different languages with moderators for each one of those languages. And on average, we have over 3,000 Facebook shares of the content that we're sharing on our pages. Uh, we recently did also a Facebook survey of our refugee.info users. Um, so this is specific to our Europe instance, but um, you know, just a couple that I wanted to highlight. 89% of our users say that the information they found on refugee info is accurate, which is huge considering the amount of inaccurate information they're exposed to on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, another one that we're really proud of is that 89% know that if they message refugee info, they will get a friendly answer from someone who wants to help. So our response rate is very, it's very important to us to create in our community and it was people coming back. Um, another area that we're really looking at is can people actually do things with the information that we give them? So 79% and 90%, 92% of the res those respondents being women said that they had used refugee info to access the service they wanted or needed. Um, so that means that they're actually acting on the information we're providing. Uh, because it's all well and good for us to put information out there, but what are people actually doing with it? And um, so this year, you know, we're really working to um, build out our tools even more so that we can get a better idea of what people actually do um, when they get the information and understand kind of what's the, what is their thought process behind that. All right, uh, so just to wrap up and then we can move on to questions, I will do this quickly because I know we only have 10 minutes. Um, so next steps are really to start pulling together a lot of these lessons learned and best practices like our assessment toolkit, our approach, our team and structure, pull these together into shareable um, toolkits so that we can push them out to partners, we can help to expand this kind of knowledge around to the rest of the humanitarian community. Um, because we really do think that we've stumbled on a new way to communicate and work with our users and we want to spread that as much as possible. This is not something we want to keep to ourselves. Um, we're also very interested in expanding, so both geographically and in our partnerships. Um, so if you're interested in partnering with us, um, please get in touch with me. I realized I did not put my contact information on this slide, but I will put it in the chat group and then we can make sure that it gets out. Uh, so we're interested in people who want to partner with us on the ground, so that could be in terms of sharing types of content, it could be wanting to lead an instance. Um, we're also interested in partners who want to work with us globally. So if they, if you have a larger geographic focus, um, please do get in touch with us. Um, and we're also interested in private partners. So, you know, something we're doing is constantly really pushing on the platforms that we're using and trying to reach vulnerable groups in new ways. And so if you have a tool that will facilitate that, we would love to hear from you. Um, and then, yeah, I'm going to let Alex speak a moment to our sustainability. So one of the things we are also looking at this year is how do you exit a context? Um, so Europe, for example, uh, it's no longer the emergency is dying down. You know, eventually we're going to have to exit. How do we make this a sustainable tool now that we have a, a, a community that trusts and uses it? And I'm going to hand that to Alex. Am I? We can hear you. We can, we can hear you. Let's speak up. Um, uh, yeah, so now, you know, in, in this first phase where we just have the app, we're thinking um, it's just an emergency. And so it's like all the information is coming from, from the NGOs um, and from the government. And um, it's really just provision. And then we move into this stage two, which is kind of um, where we are now with this um, two-way communication um, uh, phase, but looking to the future, we're thinking, okay, how can we turn over more and more and more of this project and the, its moving parts to um, both host community groups and refugees themselves? Um, so, for example, in Greece, um, we're looking at a training program um, for refugee youth. 
um, to teach them how to do social media moderation, you know, under the tutelage of our um, existing moderation team, um, and um, how can we create spaces, uh, you know, by youth and for youth, um, and how can we, you know, capitalize on what we know about how to create content for social media um, to, do, to run more trainings to um, teach more refugee youth how to, how to do some of those things, how to make a video. Um, et cetera. Um, and I think that that um, just broadly applies across our, our project now is um, the more that this can be refugee led, um, the stronger a program it is. Great. Thanks, Alex. Um, so I think that that about wraps up everything we had to say. And <laughs> I'd like to give the last eight minutes back for questions. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, uh, Megan, uh, Aaron, and Alex. Um, as you could all hear, this is an excellent example of, of collective impact in action, humanitarian and private sector working together to meet both the urgent but also ongoing needs of um, conflict-affected populations. Um, so for those of you also who are involved in the no lost generation work, we wanted to make sure to also feature one of the programs that is specifically focused on protection, as protection is one of the pillars of NLG. And as Megan, Alex, and Erin emphasized, both connectivity and access to accurate and timely information are a starting point for empowering displaced populations with what they need to make the informed decisions. So, um, we're going to jump into the questions. There are a lot of excellent questions, and we also want to make sure that um, um, through the email that we're going to follow up with, that you have direct access to these um, excellent speakers, and you can continue um, getting more information about this program. So over to you, Frederick, for our first question. Sure, no problem. Yeah, the first question was, uh, I understand you're offering useful information to refugees and the target population. Uh, do you also gather information, questions, or comments from and between refugees and affected people? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so, yes, in a short answer, that's one of the best things about Facebook. We have access to our populations on a daily basis, and so we can be monitoring what are the questions, how do people respond to certain posts that we make, you know, does that spur a huge reaction? Um, and then how do we respond to that? What kinds of private messages are we getting? Um, if we get a certain number of private messages and we know, okay, we need to make the post about this that's going public. Um, and then we also have in-person focus group discussions. So in addition to the Facebook monitoring that we do and kind of the social media monitoring, we also conduct traditional monitoring and evaluation activities um, on almost a quarterly basis. So we check in with our users to the degree possible in person. Um, as much as possible. And that has led to some of our most interesting content changes. So um, one of the things in Europe that they're also doing is that they've, they've recently added an Instagram page. And to it's a feel-good page. Like one of the main questions we got from people is, you know, we love the information you provide. The content is great. But we want happy things. <laughs> and so we created a, an Instagram page to share happy content. Um, and it's, it's, again, it's hugely popular. You know, it creates that feeling of community. It helps with feeling hopelessness that people are struggling with. Um, so it's one of those needs that just is not documented very well and that it's really hard to get programming for that we're trying to fill. Thank you, Megan. And as you speak to the needs, those needs are shared um, across the world. And there's a question about um, um, your expansion, if you have any plans to do something for the Venezuelan migrant crisis in Latin America. Yeah, we we definitely are watching the situation. Uh, both Mercy Corps and the IRC are there, and we're talking to several other potential partners. Um, we're interested in a regional response um, because this is not just a single country that Venezuelan migrants are going to. Uh, we ran assessments in the spring, and it the, the the situation on the ground is complex. Um, there's not many services available. Uh, we've also found that many of the Venezuelan migrants, though they have phones in Venezuela, they lose them or they get stolen or they sell them along the way. And so they're essentially in a kind of black hole of, for communications um, when they arrive. And so one of the things we're thinking about is how can we adjust the model so that we are maybe reverting back to some of the more traditional information sharing ideas like templates or radio, 
um, or information screens at some of the areas that people congregate when they first arrive. So we're we're currently kind of reviewing that and also watching how those needs change and how the pop whether or not the populations start getting access to phones and connectivity. Um, Mercy Corps individually is also working with NetHope right now to think about um, Wi-Fi hotspots so that we can at least start getting some connectivity in the area for people who do have phones. And we'll build the process and the, um, the response from there. Thanks, Megan. There seems to be in the audience a great interest in, in, in replicating this. So some of the questions, I'm not going to get to all of them, but one question was, what, what are the associated costs of setting up such a communications program? And do host governments contribute to the cost of running the program? That's that's a very good question, and it's um, it's a bit complicated. <laughs> so the refugee.info instance is our largest largest instance. Um, right now, we're partnering with government there, but we're not getting any funding from them. So that is definitely something we're discussing, um, particularly as we hand over Wi-Fi hotspots back to the government in Greece. Um, so so for example, uh, we we really. We have a huge team of moderators because we're serving such a large target population there. So the team is quite large. We have field editors in multiple countries. Um, so it's, it's a heavy team, um, but it's also what allows us to provide such context specific information. Um, and I'm sorry, one of our staff members there is funded by ECHO. So that is government funded. Um, and then in Jordan, we, we tried a slightly different model. So in, in, in Europe, it's a, it's a program completely unto itself. So it exists by itself like a, a traditional program. In Jordan, we integrated into an ongoing Mercy Corps protection program. And so we were able to utilize a lot of the resources that they already had. And so the team is very light. It's three people. Um, and, and they're able to maintain that way. It's also a smaller population and it's a more homogenous population. So, um, the staff speak the same language as the users. Um, so it's a quote unquote simpler context, though not, you know, not to simplify the context itself. Um, and then in El Salvador, again, we just kicked that off. Um, and we're currently looking for longer term funding for that instance. But it was uh, kicked off under the emergency response unit of the IRC. Thanks, Megan. We have time only for one more question, although there are so many excellent questions. So quickly, I'm going to try to merge a couple of questions into a single one. So um, clearly, there are a number of learnings that you have from this program on, on both sides, humanitarian sector and private sector. So if you could just highlight, um, Megan, Erin, and, and Alex, some of the key examples of how this program, how the learnings from this program are being used in defining and refining programs for refugees and vulnerable populations, and also for um, private sector uh, participation in supporting the work. Yeah. Um, so. So we are creating those toolkits and best practices that we can share out with organizations. We also actively work in the emergency context on coordinating with those organizations so that people aren't reinventing the wheel and redoing the same type of work that we're already doing. Um, and similarly, if we entered a new context where there already were ongoing activities like service mapping or like a large coordinating body, um, we would want to partner with them so that we are supporting their work. Um, so for example, if UNHCR already has a service map going in a context like in Jordan, um, we would share the information of that service map on our on our website. Um, so we are really all about collaboration on the ground in the best way for that context. Um, and just globally, you know, we definitely want to be sharing out those lessons. Um, and then, sorry, Layla, what was the second half of that question? <laughs> Uh, so any any learnings also from um, the rep the private sector representative in in this um, in this partnership in terms of the future work and support? Yeah, um, I so, think one of oh that was uh, just for Aaron. Oh, sorry. Yes, Aaron, go on. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Can you hear me now? I was yeah. talking on mute. Um, yeah, I think probably the biggest learning we've had has just been how difficult it actually is um, to get product to some of these places. Um, I think there's a reason why most people go with a, a channel partner and buy um, equipment locally, even though it's at retail price. It, we've, there's been a ton of learning that we've had just in terms of export, import, entire uh, processes related to 
getting equipment to different countries. And I do think that's a learning that we will be able to use moving forward with our product grants. Um, we're learning along the way, FedEx is learning along the way, as is Mercy Corps and NetHope. Um, so I do think those learnings will be applied moving forward. Um, I think also we've, we've engaged our Meraki team quite a bit in helping with, with training and IT architecture. And those are also learnings that we are looking to kind of standardize and make available to other organizations as well. Well, thank you very much, Erin and mm -hmm. uh, uh, Alex and Megan. This has been incredibly useful information and hopefully inspirational. And uh, there will be a lot of uh, requests to get, uh, get in touch with all of you. So we will be following up. Uh, with communications to both all the attendees, but also people that RSVP'd for this uh, session so we can get the information out. Um, I would li like to thank the audience also for a fantastic set of questions. Hopefully this has been useful exchange. And um, we will wrap it up here today. Please uh, uh, spend a couple minutes answering the questions that will pop up on your screen when you leave the WebEx today. And uh, we hope to be back in touch real soon. Uh, check out the NetApp Solutions Center for future webinars and uh, further interaction. Thanks, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, all.